Good morning, and welcome to the Advocate Times Picayune Gubernatorial Town Hall, sponsored by AARP Louisiana. I'm Stephanie Grace, columnist and editorial director for the newspapers, and I'm joined by my colleague, managing editor, Arnessa Garrett. Today's format will allow you to hear candidates for governor answering questions submitted by you, our readers, for publicate, um, excuse me, of our publications throughout Louisiana. Joining us today are Hunter Lundy, an environmental attorney from Lake Charles. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Sean Wilson, former secretary of the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. Good morning. Sharon Hewitt, state senator and former oil industry executive. Nice to be here, thank you. Nice to have you. John Schroeder, Louisiana treasurer and former state representative. Good morning. And Stephen Wagesback, former president and CEO of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry and former chief of staff for Governor Bobby Jindal. Good morning, thanks for being here. But before we get to our reader questions, we would like to thank our sponsor and share a short video from AARP Louisiana. AARP Louisiana is honored to sponsor today's gubernatorial forum with The Advocate. I'm Alfred Mason. AARP Louisiana Volunteer State President. I hope you will enjoy today's conversation with the 2023 candidates for governor as they discuss many issues that impact older adults, whether it's health security, financial resilience, digital equity, living independently in your home. You deserve to know where the candidates stand and how they will face these issues. To learn more and to get involved, visit aarp.org slash LA. Okay, let's get to it. We're asking candidates to keep your answers to one minute so that we can get to as many reader questions as possible. Thank you. And the first question comes from Victor Kowalski of Baton Rouge. If you were to rank the top three areas which you would focus on during your time as governor to make Louisiana citizens happier and healthier, what would those priorities be? And let's start with Mr. Lundy. Education, crime, and poverty. They're all linked. And so we can use education to re resolve both of them. You know, illiteracy and incarceration run hand in hand. So we want our children to be able to read and write. We know that the uh, brain of a child is 80% formed by the time they're three, 90% by the time they're four. We want to invest the resources in early childhood education that we need to do that. We have to attack poverty like never before in the state of Louisiana. No one wants to talk about it. I've been talking about it since day one. Okay. So if we attack poverty, we reduce crime. Most of the drug dealing and most of the crime is committed in impoverished, blighted areas. So those three are connected. I will attack them. We will reduce incarceration. We will educate our children. We will see that those that are incarcerated, when they get out, they have a GED, they have a trade, and they can make a living. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Well, Victor, thank you for that question. You know, a part of my campaign is to address four primary issues to make us safer, smarter, healthier, and wealthier. And it speaks to those priorities that I will lead as governor. First, to make us safer, we're gonna be focused on public safety, dealing with the immediate uh, present crisis in terms of crime all over the state of Louisiana and make sure we're being smart and sustainable in those efforts. We're gonna to work to make our communities and our state smarter by investing in early childhood education and fully funding education to make sure that throughout the educational process from zero to four, as well as K through 12 and into the university systems, that we are making the right kinds of investments to build an economy, to build a workforce that are gonna make us effective and smart and uh, successful. And then of course, being healthier. I'm committed to making sure that we maintain the Medicaid expansion, broadening that to ensure that we address uh, the mental health crisis that we have, as well as other behavioral issues and ensuring that women and seniors and children are well protected. Those three issues alone, uh, working together in concert will make us a more wealthy society. And those are my commitments and my promises, Governor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hewitt. Well, thank you. We know that we have an out-migration problem in Louisiana. We're losing population and states all around us are exploding. 
In my governorship, we will give families a reason to stay in Louisiana instead of reasons to leave. We're going to do that with a few basic things. Better education for our kids, good high paying jobs for our kids and our grandkids, safe neighborhoods, good jobs, a growing economy, an affordable cost of living, which means like zero state income tax, uh, affordable insurance, and a government that works for the people instead of the other way around, as long, and in addition to safe neighborhoods. Those are basic fundamental things that every family and every business wants. Education is the silver bullet. We're going to do that by investing in early education, getting our kids reading, getting our kids working with math, and, and have building an education pipeline that delivers jobs to Louisiana citizens so they stay right here in our state. Thank you. Mr. Schroeder. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. So let's have a little reality conversation first. These are generational problems. Born and raised here in, outside of New Orleans in the public school system. You know, my wife's a retired teacher and administrator. We want teachers to do what God intended mom and dad to do, okay? And, and it doesn't work. We're, we're dropping our kids off at schools, inspecting our teachers to fix, to be the salvation to everything. We have a fundamental problem in our families that has to get addressed because then it causes a crime problem and other issues. I'm gonna tell you something a little different. I don't think there's any new ideas. If crime, if fighting crime in early childhood is our priority, I'm gonna call a special session and we're gonna look at this budget over again. I think there was too much money wasted this past, this current fiscal year that we're in. We'll have six months left in the, in the session when, the, when I take over. I'm gonna call a special session and readjust that budget and then put the money on our priorities like early childhood and, and law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Wagesback. Yeah, so there's more than three priorities for any incoming governor, and I think we have to understand that. But here's the top three I'll tackle. First of all, the affordability crisis in Louisiana. It's too expensive to live here right now, and it's not fair and it needs to change. It starts with insurance reform. That means attracting new insurers, fortifying communities, and also reining in some of the excessive litigation costs that are taking, uh, excuse me, raising rates for everyone in this state. The second thing is education. You know, we've, we've tried to force every kid to be in the same box over the decades and it doesn't work. We have to bend the bureaucracy and meet kids where they are. So whether you're going to a four-year school, a two-year school, or straight to the workforce, it's all a great pathway. I wanna make high schools truly launch points here in Louisiana. The third thing is the unsafety crisis we have in this state. Too many people feel like they don't have safe communities. That has to stop. That means law, more law enforcement, that means more technology. That means finding facilities to bring people off the streets that need to be removed, to be detained and retrained so they can go back into society and be more productive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two related questions on education since most of you did mention education. It was also on our readers' minds. Uh, Dawn Gary from Broussard asks, what do you feel is the top priority for our education system? And what plans do you have to address that specific concern? And Dan Brandon of New Orleans asks, with the highly educated and local workforce being the cornerstone of attracting companies to locate high paying jobs in Louisiana and the years of neglect and defunding of primary and secondary education, what is your plan to increase the quality of both a high school and a college education in Louisiana? We'll start with you, Mr. Wilson. Well, thank you, Don and Dan. You know, the first action is going to be paying teachers what they actually deserve. Uh, the legislature gave them a one time stipend. And if we expect those teachers to do the things that we need them to do, we need to reward them appropriately, as well as law enforcement officers, firemen and public employees making that long term commitment. I am committed to fund them, index them and ensure that we don't use them as a uh, ping pong ball in future legislative sessions to address budget priorities. We also have to fund early childhood education and make sure that it's meaningful and make sure that it's sustainable. There are 159,000 children in the state of Louisiana that are working, um, that are studying to, to do better jobs at learning how to read and write and do all of the things we need children to do. Additionally, investing in higher education means assessing what we have in the workforce, building a curriculum that will get train them for the jobs that they need and deserve, but also ensure that we're bringing folks to the state that will hire them and pay them the wages so that they can stay in Louisiana and not travel all across the state of Louisiana or outside of Louisiana to get good compensation for the work that they do. Ms. Hewitt. Well, thank you. 
We have to reinvent how we deliver education. We have 185,000 job openings right now, and people cannot find, businesses cannot find people who want to go to work. So we have to identify what are those skills that our businesses need and those industries that we want to attract and make sure we're building the education pipeline so that we're providing those jobs for the people right here in Louisiana. So it starts in high school. And of course, we have to start earlier than that with teaching kids to read and teaching them to do math. But in high school, we need to make sure there are multiple pathways to success. So yes, I will have more dual enrollment to give kids a head start that want to go to college. I also will offer more industry-based certifications and two-year degrees while they are in high school that allow students to graduate with both a high school degree and something that they can go right into the workforce. We have to have many opportunities for success. We have so many industries in Louisiana, and we want to make sure those jobs go to our students. Mr. Schroeder. So I remember the second question. What was the first question? The first question was, what do you feel is the top priority in our education system and how would you address it? So obviously it's early childhood and we can't afford to wait to the next legislative session to address it. So if we're going to in invest in it, it needs to happen now. I don't want to wait uh, eight, nine, ten months until next August before you sign new laws into place or you have a new budget. So you, we, need, we need to come in at the first of the year and adjust this budget. There's a lot of money there. Some of it may be uh, one-time money, but I think there's areas that, that you can invest infrastructure-wise in education to start moving us down, down the road. Look, we have big problems. We're a poor state with 1.9 million people on Medicaid. So you have to, you have to figure out how do, we, how do we attack the one, two, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. We have bad mental health problems, which leads to crime problems. Um, we have to address that early on in school. Uh, maybe even before they get in school, there are some models in this own in our own state that that look like they're working. But it's all about getting the kids prepared to go walk into these schools, and everything else leads from that. Thank you, Mr. Wagensback. You know, I think the top thing we have to do is empower parents and families to take control, and I think that's that's good for a number of reasons. You know, when you talk to employers and families, they say the same thing. What we need is young adults who can read and write and stay off drugs and have good soft skills and work as a team. Those are very simple requests that the economy and families are asking for. And it's our duty to change the K-12 system to provide those types of skills. That is doubling down on early education, but also early soft skill development and early career pathway advice and counseling. And then yes, in high schools, I've talked the entire campaign about pathways to prosperity, meeting every kid where they are. There's no shame in whatever your future holds, four year, two years, straight to the workforce. High schools have to be launch points for all of those children. That's good for those families. It's good for sustainability. And it's good to fuel the economic boom that we need to go out and recruit new industries. If we can get that workforce right, that'll help um, stabilize communities, but also allow me to go around the state, excuse me, the country, recruit new industries here because they're dying for that workforce that's ready to come in and, and, and work on day one. Mr. Lundy. Well, first thing is we're going to get rid of the LEAP test. I've said that from the beginning of time, our teachers are spending too much time teaching kids to take a test and they're taking them out of the classroom when they need to learn. So we're gonna get rid of the leap test. Yes, it's about priorities. I'm the only outsider in this race. I'm not part of a political party. I'm not beholden to anybody. I'm not a lobbyist. I'm not a politician. I'm not a bureaucrat, but I come from a family of educators. My mother's a kindergarten teacher. My sister's a kindergarten teacher. So we're gonna fund lower elementary. We're going to fund pre-K education like we promised we would do. So we're going to fund that education and we're going to do it. We're not going to cut at the end of the term. We saw what happened this past legislation. What do they do? They always cut education. They cut health care and they don't, nobody knows what's happening. That's what happened this past session. So we will fund pre-K to the best of our abilities and see that our children learn from the beginning. And on another note, I will undo what the Waggus Pact Jindal years did to our UL system. Thank you. Our next question comes from an AARP member and it's about broadband. Louisiana communities have been working at lightning speed to connect residents to the internet and close the digital divide. Louisiana is projected to invest $1.3 billion in communities across the state. As governor, how will you increase affordable high-speed internet access and continue the fast pace of broadband development? Start with uh, Ms. Hewitt. 
Well, thank you. You know, broadband is everything. You know, as I travel the state, there are clearly parts of the state that don't have good internet and don't have good cell phone service. And we learned during the pandemic how important that is because that's an opportunity, again, for people to get healthcare remotely as well as education. And so we know that we have to do a better job of, of investing in broadband. Um, we have done quite a bit in the state of Louisiana with the federal dollars that we have. I do believe there will continue to be federal investments uh, because we're nowhere near having solved the problem. But I will commit part of our infrastructure dollars to broadband on the state level to make sure that we're continuing to get people hooked up. I mean, I can't imagine living in parts of Louisiana where you cannot get reliable internet service. And so that's gonna be a priority. As we're building new roads, I think there's an opportunity to lay broadband cable so that you're using the right of ways that you already have authority to use and making sure that we're continuing to get people hooked up going forward. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. I can say a thousand things on this. Look, government doesn't do anything well. And if you, if you want something to work, don't give it to government. The, the, th the mistake made here is the money's coming to the state government who doesn't know how to spend money properly. They don't, they've never done infrastructure work. It's, it's a disaster. If you listen to what's going on, who's making the money, who's getting these contracts, and, and all the way down the line, somebody's making money except the people that need it. You're talking about fixing education? Well, the people in Washington Parish, where I don't live far from, you can't get broadband up there. You want to change the culture of this state? Provide technology into our rural communities across the state, and you will see parents get uh, they have the ability to help their children study and learn and be prepared for school. But I'm tired of watching money get wasted in this state. I'm a business guy. You know, I don't know what Mr. Lundy thinks I am, but I mean, if I'm a political insider, I'm beating my way out. I'm, you have to go to work and spend this money like it's supposed to do on the taxpayers. And not everybody's got their hands in the pie. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wagesback. You know, as the state rolls out the broadband rollout right now, they need to focus more on areas that are unserved. I mean, before any uh, competition or anything like that's done, it needs to go in areas that do not have broadband. Every area of the state deserves broadband because it's a lifeline to so many things. First of all, in the new economy, a small business can be started at your kitchen table if you have a good idea. Without broadband, you don't have that opportunity. So it's a barrier to entrepreneurship if we don't go to that unserved area. Also with education. If you're a poor family right now with no broadband, and let's say you have a special needs child or a gifted and talented child, and you want to have access to online learning potential, you need that broadband. Without it, you can't get it. In our rural areas and some of our poor urban areas, they need access to virtual health care and online health care. Without broadband, they can't do it and do some of those preventative wellness checks to make them healthier, make our communities and state healthier, and help save taxpayer dollars in the long run. So that rollout on broadband needs to go to unserved areas first and then go into competitive areas, and that will happen when I'm elected governor. Thank you. Mr. Lundy. So Representative Desitel in Evolves Parish has made it his cause to get us broadband. And so we just got a $1.6 billion grant. We're one of eight states in the United States that got the most money from this government money for broadband. So it's going into place. And yes, we have 17 parishes in Louisiana that don't have OBGYN care. You know, we have these rural areas that got to have this because we need to have telemedicine. We need to allow the opportunity to exist in every parish for women to have the right health care that they deserve. And broadband is the answer. And yes, as the next governor, I'm going to be the most transparent governor that we've ever had. So you'll be able to see online where the money comes from, where it goes to, who is it appropriated to, the timeline in which it takes to build a road or show up at an event so forth. People in Louisiana will have access to that and they can look at it from their household and they'll know the truth. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. So the reality is the funds that we're receiving for broadband across the state is absolutely going to those places that are not served today. Um, I'm married to a 23 year educator who understands firsthand the learning loss that we saw. I've got health professionals in my family that understands the importance of telemedicine and what it can do. And others whose business is based solely on the internet. In rural Louisiana, we have to make the kinds of investments to create the equalization in our economy, both from a healthcare and education and an economic development perspective. 
We know those federal dollars are coming. We support those federal dollars. And as a part of this administration that sought these dollars and were nationally recognized for our programs and efforts that preceded these funds, it's important that we double down on these issues. We've understood the implementation of broadband for decades in this state. Uh, in my department, we actually managed the state's first fiber optic network in previous administrations. We gave it away, gave it to the university system as opposed to leveraging it. We've put broadband on infrastructure and across our right of ways. It's important for us to do it. We've got the resources, but you need a governor and a candidate like myself who has the relationship with the federal government to make those things work. Thank you. We got quite a few questions on the state of insurance coverage in Louisiana, including one from Maureen Ferguson of HOMA. She writes, increased insurance premiums, homeowners, auto, especially flood, are a major issue for all Louisianians. As governor, what is your plan to bring in new insurance companies and lower premium rates? Charles Colomb of New Orleans writes, how would you make it a priority in your first term as governor to lower insurance rates? We'll start with Mr. Schroeder. Well, look, I think you have to bring all the players to the table. You know, we're not going to get out of this problem by ourselves. We didn't get into it by ourselves. There's a lot of moving parts. I'm in the construction business. I'm in the real estate business. I've been, myself, my big companies, and the people who we do business with have been drastically affected by this. And it really comes on the backs of the 85 percentile, to be honest with you. It's the people who go to work every day. Who, who are getting hurt the most. And some people say, well, you got a lot of renters. Well, the, the tenants, the landlords are passing that high insurance on to the tenants. So it's absolutely something that's critical. It's probably one of the most important issues we need to face. I will put together a summit and bring all the players to the table. I'm gonna handcuff them to the table and we're not leaving until we come up with some solutions. And then we'll call the legislature in uh, to, to address it. There's probably about 20 different things that can be done with no silver bullet but let's be honest, until the billboard lawyers get to the table and we fix our legal climate and have them participate in this fix, it's going to be tough to do. But it's it's critically important to the success of our state. Mr. Wag is back. Yeah, well, this is the top issue I hear across the state. And it's the top issue I've been talking about the entire campaign. It takes a multifaceted approach to solve this. You have to attract new insurers. You have to change the way we regulate those entities to give them some flexibility throughout the year so they can control the cost increases they ask for. And you need a strong insurance commissioner who's going to push back on any time they ask for an increases. And I think incoming Commissioner Temple is committed to doing just that. You also have to fortify communities. We have to invest in how we better manage water, how we uh, place roofs on houses, how we make repairs so it's stronger, better than ever, we can take that punch. And yes, the biggest piece is the legal reform piece. You have to rein in these excessive lawsuits. There are a handful of billboard attorneys who are making very big payouts and it comes out of your pocket as a rate payer. That has to stop and it won't stop unless you elect a governor who is willing to take on this very complicated and complex fight. I've committed to doing that. That is why every attack ad you see on me is funded by those same billboard attorneys who don't want you to mess up their payday. I want to come in, bring everyone to the table, work with Commissioner Temple, provide those solutions for you all. If we don't do that, it will become an unaffordable state for all of us to live in. Mr. Lundy. Uh, the only billboard attorneys I know are the ones that are supporting Jeff Landry, and he's in hiding today, and he's not part of this forum. But I will say this. I've negotiated $10 billion day deals, and I've negotiated $10 deals. I can sit at the table with any CEO of any company. I do know, having experienced Laura, Delta, Ida, Rita, Katrina, and helping businesses and churches and small oystermen, fishermen, everybody through these hurricanes that we can solve the problem. And I'm not going to pander and be in fear of any insurance company like some of these constituents of mine up here sound like they're in fear of these insurance companies. They're coming back. State Farm's already back in Louisiana. They're taking the market back. Some of the ones that didn't comply, yes, they're out of business now. So we don't have to be afraid of insurance companies, but they are going to insure hurricanes and they're going to insure wildfires or they're not going to do business in my administration because that's what they're talking about not doing right now. Mr. Wilson. As governor, I will hold big insurance companies accountable and you don't do it by bailing them out to the tune of $45 million when they've left Louisianians high and dry. I've got a college student at home and we're paying insurance and we see the same spike that you do. We have family members who've been damaged by hurricanes and have the same struggles that most of our citizens are facing. 
we've got to have a special session. We've got to address issues like adjuster accountability, creating timelines in terms of notification and information and holding insurance ac companies accountable to make sure that they honor the commitments that you make as a premium payer. We've also got to deal with some common sense laws in terms of drivers and whether or not credit should even be considered when they make your rating and set your standard uh, premium pays. The other thing you have to do is work with the federal government to ensure that the risk rating 2.0 has more transparency, that it's effective, and that it's balanced and is treating people equally. Somebody's got to hold them accountable. It's unfair for them to have done to Louisianians what they've done. And as a high risk market, we have to address that. We have to grow the competition and bailing them out is not the way to do it. We will grow the competition effectively and smartly, working collaboratively with insurance, trial lawyers, and most of all, the citizens of this state. Ms. Hewitt. Yes, we are in an insurance crisis. Families are faced with having to walk away from their homes because they cannot afford the property insurance. And if you live below I-10, you can't afford the flood insurance. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, here comes your automobile insurance renewal. People are dying. They cannot get this, they can't pay their bills. And so yes, I will have a special session immediately after getting sworn in so that we can address this. We have two basic issues, how we regulate the industry and legal reform. We have to regulate them in a way that allows the free market to work. Insurance companies need to be able to set their rates and compete in an open market and, and compete for your business. And the only way we're gonna do that is, is by opening the doors and saying, we want you to work here in Louisiana and to give them the opportunity to do that. Automobile insurance, again, too much regulation in that industry and direct source and collateral source, those are all issues that I have been working on in the legislature. You're not gonna get this done by putting a lawyer in the governor's office. You're only gonna get it done with an engineer who's committed to really solving the problem. Thank you. Uh, this next question, we'll start with Mr. Wagespach and it comes from C. Taylor from Folsom. What are your plans to address climate change and bring clean energy companies to Louisiana while holding oil and gas companies accountable for the damage they've already done? So the great opportunity Louisiana has is we are the epicenter of that great research. We live on the, the, the country and the world's, quite frankly, largest living delta. So we know coastal restoration. We know the research is happening there. We're putting $50 billion over a long period of time to rebuild land in a way. So we are the laboratory for the world on that front. Also, some of the cutting edge investments you're seeing around the country are happening right here in Louisiana. You have traditional energy providers actually investing in the next generation of energy development and the renewable side, which is exciting. So we need to explore that more. We have carbon capture, we have wind off of our shores. All of that needs to be cultivated and developed and added to our traditional energy base. The best thing of all of that is it's Louisiana producers who know in the, how to produce the old energy and are be trained to produce the new energy. That creates economic opportunity for us. The last thing we should do is send everyone overseas to go to other countries which do not have the environmental safeguards we have, do not have the opportunity we have or investment we have. We need to actually cultivate American energy, bring it to Louisiana, and show the world how to transfer from this existing energy sources into the newer, cleaner ones of the future. Future. Thank you. Mr. Lundy. I'm all for the oil and gas industry and we needed to come back, but I'm all about justice. If you mess up, you clean up. We've got thousands of canals dug through our marshlands that are contributing to the coastal erosion and the problems we have today. And so let them have their day in court, enforce it. From Cameron Parish all the way to St. Bernard Parish, they've got suits against these oil and gas companies who didn't live up to the law. And it was during the Jindal administration that they wouldn't enforce the law. And so let it be. If they're innocent, they're innocent. If they're guilty, they need to pay. We need to stop the coastal erosion problem. And as far as clean energy, I'm all for it. You know, we talked uh, the other day about the, the, the green hydrogen that's taking place. You know, Europe is going to methanol instead of diesel fuel for the maritime industry. We're going to build methanol plants all over. Right now, we got a biodiesel plant, billion dollar plant going up in convent. We got uh, blades being built for windmills. The windmill bidding has already taken place off of Cameron and other places around the state. There's a project in New Iberia. Okay. So I'm for clean energy, but I want the oil and gas industry to survive. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Well, first, you have to acknowledge that things are different than they were 35 years ago. My father worked in the oil, oil business as a kid. And yes, there were damages done to our state and our coast, and it's affecting our way of life. Just look at the Mississippi River, the lowest it's ever been. Saltwater intrusion becoming a reality to citizens that have never seen it before. The way you address it is you hold people accountable, and you do it in a way that's fair and balanced and consistent. 
I'm the only candidate that has a proven record of doing that. And when you attract new business, when you look at the green energy out there, the clean energy opportunities we have, you have to have the infrastructure to support it to leverage our natural resources, whether it's ports, whether it's rail, whether it's interstate system. Look at the LA-1 Expressway that we're spending $400 plus million dollars building today under our administration when I was secretary of the department. It's to attract folks for those types of jobs that are going to be on the coast for the jobs that are formerly in the oil and gas industry that we will now put to work using the same skill sets. It will also be an opportunity for businesses to come to Louisiana, invest in renewables in not just urban areas, but in rural areas to grow our economy, create good paying jobs and be respectable citizens to protect our environment. Thank you, Ms. Hewitt. Well, thank you. Look, energy is one of the most important things ever. I mean, you cannot live without it. As a former oil and gas executive, I understand the energy business better than any candidate on the stage. And I can tell you that oil and gas is, first of all, one of our most nat valuable natural resources in Louisiana. So we need to use the natural resource that God gave us. We will have a place for oil and gas always. But we also need to diversify our portfolio and we can do that and we are doing that with wind and solar and hydrogen and i have invested helped invest state dollars to do that but the last thing you should be doing is what the attorney general is doing jeff landry is joining the trial lawyers in suing 200 oil and gas companies claiming that they have damaged the coast what you need to do is to tell the department of natural resources to do their job to enforce the coastal permits and use what is already in state law available to them to do so. You don't just sue everyone and drive the industry out of our state, which is exactly what's happening right now. We're losing oil and gas jobs because of the actions of Jeff Landry and the trial lawyers. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. That's a, a good, a great question because we have hundreds of thousands of jobs that rely on the oil and gas industry. As your state treasurer who manages the money, I've taken on corporate America who has waged war in the fossil fuel industry, uh, not only in Louisiana, but across this country. I do believe corporations should take care of their problems. You, if you create a mess, you should clean it. Moving forward, that's what we need to do. We need to enforce it. <clears throat> What's happened in the past, I'll let the lawyers fight about that in, in court, but I will tell you it'll be very hard for the Attorney General to do, to do that if you look at all the money and the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars he's taken. But look, government, I said this earlier, government doesn't do very many things well at all. Our main focus ought to be on education and, and, and public safety. We don't, we don't, the government is not entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur, and I know government doesn't do anything real well. I'll let industry handle. We'll, we we want to make policy and, and laws that attract business and not hinder those okay. industries. Thank you. And we have a quick follow-up, yes or no. We'll try to go right down the line and start <clears throat> with Mr. Wagus back. Uh, would you continue to pursue Governor Edwards' plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050? Yes or no? I support the goal. We'll do it differently. Okay. Mr. Lundy? Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes, environmentalists and industry have supported it as well. Okay, Ms. Hewitt. Again, I think goals are great. And I think the work that we're doing with carbon capture and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is very important. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. You're gonna hold me to the rules? Yes or no. You said yes, yes or no. Or no. Yes or no. no rules have to be the rules. So okay. if, if, if it's yes, yes or no, or you no, can say a little more if you'd like. Well, I, then I would say yes, if we could yes. say a little bit more. Okay. But with a, a whole bunch of changes, I think we okay. all support the environment. Um, that's not a yes or no answer, okay. but certainly I like the goal. Thank you. Now we have another question from an AARP member. Older adults are routinely targeted by scammers on the phone, the internet, and now through AI. Last year, nearly 45,000 older Louisianans reported fraud that resulted in over $43 million in losses. As governor, how would you enact policy changes and enforce laws that will protect our older consumers? Mr. Lundy. Well, I would propose legislation to uh, uh, strict penalties of crime than anybody that's taken advantage of our senior citizens. Uh, we would have to do a better job of monitoring phone calls. We would have to insist on an attorney general to do their job that hasn't been done in, in the last seven years. So we've got to have an attorney general that does his job, that has a section on, that he can prosecute these people when they're found. The local DAs have to implement policies against some of these calls. 
and um, it's been going on for a decade now. And so I would I would implement and institute and propose legislation to make the law stricter on these people that are taking advantage of our senior citizens. And then I would um, have education. We got to educate and do it through the senior citizens and the communities uh, service centers. I mean, we have senior citizens communities all over the state. We send people in there and we educate them to know a signal when they're getting a call, when somebody's asking about their social security number, somebody's asking about a, a question of their personal finances. That's a signal that it's a fraudulent call. Thank you. So it's about Thank education you. and enforcement. Mr. Wilson. Well, look, scamming citizens is nothing new. And this is another example, I think, where uh, artificial intelligence has made it even more difficult for us to take advantage of the resources to protect our citizens and not just our seniors, but our young people as well. As someone who really believes in collaboration and partnership, I'm able and willing to work with ARP and other stakeholder organizations to ensure that we're educating seniors and providing them the resources in addition to holding uh, individuals and violators accountable. These are examples of what our state attorney general have missed the boat on already. Uh, these are things that we see every season of hurricanes where people get taken advantage of. We have to be thoughtful. We have to be good in terms of making sure we're addressing consumer issues and protecting our citizens. And as governor, I will always put that first whether it's passing laws, making information available, creating technology tools to help individuals understand when a scammer is calling someone that's not identifiable, making sure that our seniors are protected and working with the nonprofit and the faith-based communities and others that work directly with those communities to make sure they have at their fingertips the tools they need to protect themselves. And when they are violated or abused, we will step up and represent them and defend them as well. Ms. Hewitt. Well, thank you. This is just one example of many issues related to the elderly in our state, they, they're largely being forgotten. The first thing we need to do is to create the Office of Elderly Affairs to be a standalone department so that it gets the attention and the funding and the resources that it needs instead of it being bounced around as it has been within different agencies within state government because they are not getting the, the resources that they need. So yes, education is certainly part of that in, in informing uh, our elderly, our senior citizens about the dangers of scammers. We need an attorney general that will investigate this and hold people accountable. There is so much that needs to be done, just even basic funding. We know that our seniors want to age at home. We have to do a better job of giving them the resources and the ability to do that so that people don't all end up with nursing homes being the most viable option. You know, there's a place for that but they wanna age at home as long as they can. Those are all things that we can do when we create that department to be a standalone agency within the state. Mr. Schroeder. Well, look, crime is a crime. <clears throat> I would tell you, we need an attorney general's office that, that really goes after consumer um, crime big time uh, because it's low on a totem pole, but it causes the most broad problems. It preys on our elderly and it's not just, uh, T the technology, it is preying on uh, elderly during hurricanes, during natural disasters, with the percentages of, of um, I, I think, percentages being uh, collected by, by different entities from the legal industry, the contractors, it ought to be criminal. And But you need a consumer protection division that really goes after this really hard because you have to deter crimes. You have to prevent them, you have to deter them, and you have to have things in place that penalize them to stop them from doing it because you can't go fix every phone for every single citizen in the state. We've got an aging population, um, and the, we need a very, very aggressive consumer affairs division under the Attorney General's office. Mr. Wag is back. Yes, I, I also agree with an Office of Elderly Affairs, an, an independent agency. I've heard that from the Council of Aging Directors that I've met with across this state, and that, that makes sense <coughs> to me, and I think we need to get that done. You know, also, if you think about that Council of Aging Enterprise, when you walk into some of those facilities, there's so many things being offered on site there. And yes, there's entertainment aspects there, but also there's a lot of continuing education opportunities at those COAs. We need to maximize that to educate the, the senior populations of these scam marks that are out there. I'm also in support of increasing penalties for anyone 
anyone who preys on seniors, but also we cannot forget about the developmentally disabled also in this fight. Look, I, my wife and I have a son that we know is going to grow up into an adult person with disabilities, and I don't want him taken advantage of any more than anyone else. And there has to be safeguards in place for people like that, because the goal of any parent in this sense is to have that person live independently one day and safeguarding them from scam Mars is critical. So increasing penalties, enhancing protections, and utilizing those COAs across the, across the state to be a center of gravity to educate folks on those opportunities there is a, is a key piece of my administration. Okay. Thank you. Um, this next question, it comes from Mike Perry of Metairie. And let's make it just a straight yes or no question, no commentary down the line. We'll start with Mr. Wilson. And the question is, do you believe Joe Biden is the legitimately elected president of the United States? Yes, yes or no? Ms. Hewitt? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, this one is also a favorite of ours. Uh, maybe it could be uh, something that you can answer quickly as well. Danny Garrett of Baton Rouge asks, other than yourself, which candidate do you think would make the best governor? We'll start with Ms. Hewitt. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a tough question, you know, because we're all running because we think we would be the best candidate. You know, so look, I, I respect everyone who's running for office. This is not an easy thing to do to run for governor. And I think that every candidate here offers different strengths and weaknesses. And it's up to the voters to decide, I think, which of us better aligns with your values and gives you the best plan for how to get there. You know, we think we have the best plan with the Hewitt blueprint. And so I would ask you to go to our website at SharonHewitt.com and check out my plan. Let's, and I will let all of the candidates sort of make their own case. Well, let's restart. So the parameters are you have to say a name <laughs> and it's not a formal endorsement. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm going to do that. <laughs> Mr. Schroeder. Yeah, I'm not either. Let me just say this. <laughs> well, if, you, if you really want to name her, her name is Ellie Schroeder. because She's a rock star educator retired business lady and entrepreneur. Look, I believe you need a CEO to run the operation. Uh, and, you know, some people, and I, this is what I was referring to earlier about Mr. Lundy. I don't know about everybody else. I got 10 years between my criminal justice career, my law enforcement career and teaching, nine and a half years in the legislature, six years as your treasurer and over 33 years in business. I didn't go to work for a job per se, I created jobs already. I know what it feels like to pull a dollar out of my pocket and have to go negotiate and build businesses and build and create jobs. I've already done that, okay? That is not government's role. Government's role is to get out of the way of business, okay? That's a bad, bad problem in this state. We're infected by the cronyism. We're infected by the corruption. And I will end that as your governor. How about you, Mr. Waggis Backer? Can you answer? Well, look, obviously this is a job interview for all of us. So I guess I, I would support any candidate who is willing to show up and answer questions for a job interview. So I guess I'll just kind of leave it at that. You can read between <laughs> those lines. Um, look, at the end of the day, I'm a first time candidate. And so I've learned a lot over the last six and a half months on how this is. And I guess I would agree with some of the comments I've made thus far. It's hard to put yourself out there. Um, you know, we, we've been in this race. My wife and I work this 24 seven every single day. We've had a universe of family and supporters that have come in and, and been on the team and have helped us on day one. And look, it's tough to hear some of the things you hear, the lies about your record over the years, and you have to develop a certain scar tissue on there. But I will tell you this, I've been so emboldened. When you go around the state, people of the state are good. And I don't care if you're talking to Republicans or Democrats or independents or whatever, there's a lot more we have in common that anyone wants to admit. Modern politics uh, wants everyone to be divided and, and corrosive. The truth is we all have a lot in common. So I guess if I can't be there, I'd want anyone who wants to pull out the greatness in Louisiana, bring people together and solve problems. And I, I would wish that person success if it's not me. Mr. Lundy. So I'm sitting here on a panel. I'm an independent in this race. I'm not beholden to any political party whatsoever. I'm sitting here with a Democrat and three Republicans. But I'll say this. I plan on being in a runoff with Jeff Landry, and I'm working to do that because I am a, a guy. I am a David that fights the Goliath. And I'll, you know, I agreed with Governor Edwards on some things and not on others. But the one thing that I agreed with him on is that Jeff Landry is not a good man, and we will be embarrassed if he were to be elected governor. 
And so any one of these people here alongside me, they're people of, they're people, they're good people. Now, do I agree, I disagree immensely with the philosophy of a bureaucrat or someone who came out of the Vitter General administration? I sure do. And and the attacks on on that are made against my profession, I disagree with it. But I'm in a battle to slay the giant, and that's Jeff Landry. And so I'm the alternate candidate that you can choose. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Well, Danny, thank you for the question. And my middle name is David, and I have a slingshot. And I'm going to translate for all of the folks that you just heard. They all are referring to me. I'm the only candidate that has 25 years of working in Democratic and Republican administrations. The reason I'm here is public service has been my ministry. And the reality is the extremism is too high. When I got into this race, I realized that there were no candidates that were in this race that I felt comfortable voting for. Not that they were bad people. They're all good people. They all have passion. They're honorable. But in terms of what the citizens need in making us safer, smarter, healthier, and wealthier, and toning down the partisanship and the extremism and the divisiveness to respect Louisianians, regardless of economics, regardless of your zip code, urban, rural, black, white, rich, poor, it does not matter if you care about people. And I've got a heart for the people of this state, and that's why I'm running. And so I respect everyone who puts their name out there, and I'm going to trust the citizens to do what's best and look at an individual's record, their accomplishments, and not the rhetoric, not the sound bites, but look at the policy, look at the person, look at what they've done, and then you will see who's the best candidate. And I, I submit to you that I'm that guy. Okay, thank you all very much. And Danny, we tried. So <laughs> um, one last question from our AARP members. Older adults outnumber kids for the first time in U.S. history. This has great implications on Louisiana's critical services, like home and community-based services that help older adults live independently in their homes. As governor, how will you ensure seniors have more choice in where they can receive their long-term care, whether it's home and, um, or community services or institutional care like nursing homes? And we'll start with Mr. Schroeder. Well, look, um, my kids tell me I'm not far from there, you know, so uh, and I'm fixing to be 63. So I'm a senior um, and I'm in small business. So a lot of the our population is growing older. I see. And I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older that I think the population is getting older. Mm -hmm. But we help employ elderly because there's so many jobs out there now that that the young people don't want that of perfect jobs for elderly who are retired, um, just want to you know, subsidize their incomes. Um, but as the elderly population becomes bigger in this state, they, it's almost like a, a economic boom, in my opinion, because you have talent, you have people with good wisdom who can come back into the workplace. We just have to make it friendly for them. Technology, they can work from home a, a lot now. I mean, there's a lot of things that have changed in society now that you know, where, where my parents retired in their late 50s, early 60s, man, you can work very easily into your 70s and 80s. So I'm sorry. Mr. Wagesback. This is a challenging issue for every family. My, our family went through this. My, my dad passed away about eight years ago and he had vascular dementia. So the last couple of years are very challenging for us. And we ended up keeping him in the home. We had long-term care insurance, thankfully, that helped us. So we had options as a family. But the providers that we brought into our homes a lot of times were hit or miss. And it was very challenging for my mom, especially. And so, look, having a choice doesn't mean there are good options for every community. So we have to re refill this workforce just like any other industry. And so whether it's a nursing home, whether it's a home-based provider, whether it's anything in between, we have a duty to go out into the schools and educate trained workforce to be there because giving a family an option doesn't do any good if there's not good choices on the ground for that family to take care of. You know, at the end of the day, I believe in government, everything we need to do needs to be dollar for the child as much as possible.
Egypt. He was 80 years old. So we have a productive society, and we're going to take care of our senior citizens when I'm the governor. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. If you want to learn about a community or a state, ask how they're taking care of their seniors and their children. Those are things I'm vehemently committed to. And as governor, I will make it a priority. I will make sure that the Office of Elderly Affairs that exists today is actually a cabinet member in my administration to communicate to us, not just to me, but to the citizens of this state and to every agency in this state government, the importance of taking care of our seniors. That's why you hear me talk about things like making sure communities are safer and that they're smarter to educate people throughout their lives, that they're healthier to make sure that we have a network of hospitals and caregivers to ensure that individuals can age gracefully and independently and in a way that they can have some dignity and quality of life about themselves. Those are things that as governor, I will commit to doing, making sure that living in Louisiana is affordable, fighting to make sure that they're protected in terms of consumer services, as well as the insurance industry, making sure that we have their needs met. And that starts with having a relationship, not just with AARP that I've worked together with over the last 10 years or 17 years at the department, but for the next eight years as governor, I will work and have an audience with them on a regular basis. And, and that's my commitment to the seniors and the families of Louisiana. And Ms. Hewitt. Well, thank you. You know, we are getting to, to where this is another crisis. We have more um, citizens who are aging than we do the young people coming along behind them. You know, that's why there's so much talk about Social Security is going to go bust in like eight or nine years because we have more people pulling out of the system than we have replenishing the system. And so we're an aging population. The young people are having fewer children. And we have to figure out a way to do a better job of taking care of our senior citizens. They do deserve to have the office and the governor's office, the Office of Elderly Affairs, as I said earlier, and more funding and more services. You know, for some people, when Coast and St. Tammany comes to that elderly person's home, they're the only person perhaps that day or that week that that elderly person might see. And so we have to make sure that we're better funding services for them. They do want to age at home. And so these home and community-based services are gonna be very important. And with technology, we're in a much better place of being able to do that and to support them at home. And so I look forward to continuing that conversation and finding ways we can support our seniors. Thank you. We'll move to our final question for the panel. This is from Linda Tutin from Ruston. How would you clean up our major cities New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Shreveport, and make them safe to visit again. Mr. Wagaspat. Crimes hitting every area of this state, not just our major, major cities. And the good news is there's some common denominators. First of all, we need more police on the streets, quite frankly. As inflation has driven up wages, it's harder to compete to draw people to law enforcement. You have to pay them, you have to train them, and you have to back them up as a leader whenever they do such a dangerous job to keep us safe. I will do that with the Training Academy of the State Police and help the local levels as best I can. Second is technology. We need uh, body cams, license plate readers, street side cams to prove cases. People are scared to testify, even if they know something these days. Video evidence can do that. Keep families safe. Put perpetrators in jail. That's a huge piece. The last thing is we know of a juvenile vi a violent crime crisis in this state. 14 and 19 year olds are creating crimes all across the state. We have to develop regional facilities that can take those folks off the streets, detain them first, then retrain them, give them a GED or drug treatment, or whatever it takes to actually hopefully roll them back into society. But right now, the catch and release program is broken. It's unsustainable and it will stop when I'm elected governor. Mr. Lundy. I looked at the, um, the program that New York City did in the 1990s, and they called it the Window Breakers Program. And so they went after the young criminals. We have to reinstate our juvenile justice system. And that way they rehabbed them. That way they didn't become hardened criminals. And so we have a lot of 14, 15, 16-year-olds committing crimes. we got to reach out and get them. We can't let these older criminals groom them by giving them guns. And we got to go after these older criminals. So that's, that's going to be a priority. And so we go after, we educate, we equip, we do all the things that are necessary for our law enforcement. I've set up from the beginning of this race, we got to pay our teachers, we got to pay our law enforcement, we got to pay our firemen. We're 35th on teachers, we're 48th on law enforcement and dead last on firemen. So if we don't pay the people that protect us, what do we expect the rest of the nation to think about Louisiana? So we're gonna take care of the people that take care of us. We're gonna take care of the law enforcement people and we'll, we'll get rid of poverty. We'll get rid of crime and we'll do it through education, hard work and a strong, intelligent effort. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. 
Well, to my neighbor in Ruston, thank you for that question. We're in the city of New Orleans today, where I grew up. My mom still lives in the shotgun house where she raised my brother and I as a single mother. I know what it's like to live in the city and do with these crises, and I understand that it doesn't have to be this way. You need a governor that's going to be firmly committed to making sure that you're safe. And it starts with making the kinds of investments in law enforcement to be smart, to address these old issues in new ways, to make sure that we have systemic improvements and not necessarily target communities like the attorney general has to, to have been derelict in his duties for the last seven and a half years. The most important thing I will tell you is you're going to have a governor in Sean Wilson that will work with mayors and police chiefs and district attorneys and judges and others to implement justice fairly and consistently to ensure that our communities have the opportunity to evolve and be what they want to be. But it's got to be a whole of government effort. It's going to involve churches. It's going to involve families. It's going to cause us to have to address the fentanyl crisis and the opioid epidemic in ways that we've never seen it. It's going to cause us to have to make the kinds of investment in quality of life and in government services to do a better job for communities to be the communities that they can be with the leadership that they elect. And I'm committed to doing that. Thank you, Mrs. Hewitt. Thank you. Well, it starts with more boots on the ground, for sure. We have to do a better job of recruiting and retaining law enforcement. I will do that by increasing pay for state troopers and more supplemental pay for local law enforcement. And we will have more state trooper academies, so we're training more people to get them boots on the ground. I will offer state trooper troops specially designed to the locations, those large cities, perhaps, that need some extra help in the short term, and we can do that. We do have to invest more in mental health. We've hardly tipped the scales on mental health. We have to get drugs off our street. I passed legislation this session addressing fentanyl, where we will throw the book at fentanyl dealers and those that are manufacturing counterfeit pills in their kitchens. We will take care of that. We also have to look at reentry programs. Uh, we did a lot of work in 2017 to try to, again, give new skills, workforce and education skills to nonviolent offenders. We need the data to see what programs are working and which are not. And for those violent offenders, we need to lock them up. Mr. Schroeder. So in my first professional career, uh, I was a CID special agent in the Army. I was a narcotics agent, uh, worked a short time with the Central Parish Sheriff's Office as an undercover narcotics guy. Look, I, I've been on those streets, these cities you talk about. I've been there. I've done it. I've said my last prayer before. I've supervised young narcs. I know what it is and what needs to happen to fight crime. You don't do it by yourself. It takes partnerships. It takes relationships. I was on a Louisiana drug task force some 30 years ago. We need to reinstate that. But I want to start with the state police. We're going to have the most elite troop in America. We're going to fund them. We're going to give them the equipment they're going to need. We're going to educate them, but I'm going to hold them accountable. My command staff will be held accountable and I will oversee that personally. And we will work with these cities because this it's a culture. The criminal has to know that it's our streets, our neighborhoods and our communities. And you're not going to do your crimes here, but mental health is the most pressing thing because you got to prevent crime, the current crime and mental health is paramount. Thank you. Well, uh, on behalf of the Times Picky and the Advocate, we'd like to thank all the candidates for joining us. And again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, AARP of Louisiana. And we'd also especially like to thank our readers for these great questions to the candidates. If you at home enjoyed this type of informative conversation, join us, become a subscriber to the Times Picky, NOLA.com, the Baton Rouge Advocate, the Acadiana Advocate, and our newest edition, the Shreveport Exposure Advocate. The latest offer is on your screen. Thank you.